Nebuchadnezzar's army surrounding this hillside right here. 36 acres. 35, 36 acres hill there that the Temple Mount's built upon. Right here on this side, down through here, down at the far end, you can't see it so good on this picture, but this eastern gate. At the eastern gate, the, the Muslims had put a cemetery because they wanted to stop they wanted to try to stop this picture right here is from the Garden of Gethsemane to the, picture, to the Temple Mount. We're in the Garden of Gethsemane right here to the picture of the Temple Mount. This gate right here has been stoned up as the eastern gate. That's the gate that Jesus, when He comes down to this earth at the battle, to battle with the Battle of Armageddon, is going to come right through that gate right there no matter what the stones are there or not. Then He comes through the gate, come through the wall and and Acts on the eighth day walk right through the wall. This wall ain't going to stop him either. That graveyard ain't going to stop him either. That's right. Because he has all power in heaven and earth. Whatever he says goes. Whatever he says goes. I'm telling you, that's the way it is. The way it's going to be. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Je uh, Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 1. This is where Jeremiah steps in. Isaiah had been the prophet bringing them up to this time. Jeremiah steps in the saddle and gets on. Goes through a lot of things. For God, through the calling of God. The calls of God are without repentance, church. Amen. When he was a little child and, and everything, and, and America was uh, in its uh, uh, prosperity age and everything, and, and there were progress going on and the churches were open and they were crying out in World War I. Uh, this, this, these pews you're sitting in was in a church in Trent, in Trenton, New Jersey. Oak pews. Sitting in a big stone church in Trenton, New Jersey in World War I The day we had our first church service here, the Heaven Saints, Barry Mason, the Exhales Angel, was having a rally up in Sevierville. Pastor Keith was up there, Jeff was up there, and others were up there camping with them and having church services under that podium up there. And, and, and so Keith had befriended a, a minister that came down to this bike rally, a uh, Christian bike rally, he befriended this preacher up there and they got to talking and, and he, he, he Pastor Keith was telling him about our church service, how we had plastic chairs and everything. He told Pastor Keith that we just built new pews. If you if you want our old pews, just come up here and get them, we'll give them to you. So we were at, we had our first church service at two o'clock instead of one o'clock. So Pastor Keith left up there, came to church here, and he got up before the congregation sitting there in those in those white chairs, plastic chairs, and, and, and told the church that and run into a preacher said he had pews up there that we could have if we go get them. We had a tremendous service. The woman that's standing there came gave her life to the Lord that day. Uh, I mean, we just was having a, a, a great time in the Lord. And Whenever we walked out of service, there was one of the guys in the church that said he had a backhoe business that was putting in septic fields and stuff. So he had a big dump truck and a big trailer he hauled his back his backhoe on. So here he comes up outside after his church service says, The Lord told me to go visit my mom. She lives in Trent, New Jersey. Uh He went home and by the middle of the week he had unloaded his backhoe off of his uh, uh, trailer, took his dump truck and hooked it to the trailer and went to Trenton, New Jersey. And by Friday he had these pews back here. 
We put them back together where they took them apart and everything. And the Lord, the Lord ministered to me to sit in every pew and pray. I spent, I know, over 20 to 30 minutes in every pew in this room praying and asking the Lord to, to fill me with the Spirit that these pews had, had, had been in the presence of. That they, and, and the Lord showed me to start with. I was sitting there and the Lord showed me back in World War I how that mothers and fathers and children were gathering into the sanctuary of that big church up there and they were sitting in these pews crying out for their sons and their husbands and their children that went up, was over there fighting the war. How that in these pews, in that church, many miracles transformed. The power of God raised the dead. The power of God changed situations for men and women in their lives. And how the anointing of God is, is saturated in the fibers of this wood. I don't know about you, but every time I come into this sanctuary, I feel an awesomeness, power, and glory in this room. I have to respect it. I have to honor it because I feel it. I wouldn't even wear a hat in this room. Oh, yes. Amen. I'm telling you, what would it be like to be a man like Jeremiah facing a nation and knowing the peril of the nation and the nation is just like where we're at today? To a bigger scale. To a bigger scale. Listen to what Jeremiah is saying here. In Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 1. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thy espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness, in the land that was not sown. Can you picture a church? He's talking about the wilderness when he brought Israel out of captivity. Picture, ladies, being pregnant with the whole nation. Not just twins, but a whole nation of people. And all of a sudden, God shows up and says, I'm going to deliver you from your peril, from your tribulation. But there's, there's a force in a person, in a woman, I'm not, I'm not never had a baby, but I, and I don't want to. But I, I'm telling you, I couldn't imagine the, the, the force that would be in a woman that fights against that birth coming forth. Don't want to let go. It's still attached. It's, it's growing inside your belly and it's attached to you. A biblical core. Nourishing. Being nourished and strengthened by you. It don't want to come out of that water and happens, but then, then here they go. Out of, uh, out of captivity. Down to the Red Sea. Here they are facing the enemy again. But the birth's about to take place. Birth is about to take place, but let me tell you something right there is the hardest time I hear of a birth is right at the time when you think the water's done broke and, and it's holding everything up and everything, and here's the enemy, you're at the point of life or death. Giving birth not no walk in the park either, but giving birth is... A, you get to the place of either life or death. For you and the baby. But let me tell you something. When they thought it was all over with, 
Moses stepped out on the rock there and held the staff of God that, that God gave him for a sign that he was with them and the water broke forth in two directions. And Israel came through the water just like and just like Noah and, and his wife and children and their wives came through the flood. There's a lot to this thing in symbolic nature of how we're to live in a world that is God created, God formed, God ruled and reigns over. There's a lot to it. This is a this is in remembrance. Then these things that God gives us to do is in remembrance of Him. We're to remember. We're to remember that we're not of this world. We're born of another world now. I lived in the lost and dying world. I lived in the peril of busted and broken and sick and disgusted. I, I lived in the part of getting three steps ahead and getting knocked back in. And let me tell you, you reap what you sow. But praise God, there's a finish line. There's a finish line. Praise God. When they came out through the through the through the, the Red Sea, they went into the wilderness, they came to, to the Father, they came to Mount Sinai, and they bowed before God, and God came down on the mountain before them, scared them to death. That's what we need to happen to us. God needs to scare some of the sin out of us. Amen. Some of this will that we've got to go about doing all kinds of things. And it's not something that hasn't happened before. It happened to Israel. God's chosen people. It happened to them right here. It's going to happen to America just like it happened to Israel because of the same things that Israel did, America's doing Verse 3, Israel was holy unto the Lord and the first fruit of his increase. All that devour, all that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. Hear ye the, the word of the Lord, O house of, of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, what iniquity have their fathers found in me. The Lord's asking, what has He done that you don't re respect Him anymore? Ask God. What has He done that we can't honor Him the way He ought to be honored? That we can't get to the place that we realize how great God is. Oh, we sing about it. How great God is. We do a little explanation about it, but let me tell you something. God's greater than we could ever explain or ever, ever display to someone else. Let me tell you what God did for me. Let me tell you what God did for me. When I finally got that place that God orchestrated my life that I had nowhere else to turn, we turn to God. I can see it. I can see it plainly looking back on it. Hindsight's twenty twenty. I can see Him bringing our lives into a place that that we decided that the only way we were going to make it is to turn our lives to go to church, get in church. That was the only way we were going to make it. I was so. Addicted, I could. She told me I was an iron worker, iron workers union, and everything, and I made good money. I had a, 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 a work attitude, you know. I didn't miss work, uh, even though I went to work drunk and drinking and everything else, and drugging and everything else. But I went to work. But every time I'd get a check, it didn't last past Friday or Saturday. <coughs> She told me, said, it don't make no difference how much money you make. If you're going to do what you're doing now, it won't be enough. Never. 
won't be enough. You, 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 you can imagine how, how black I was, how black hearted I was, how, how evil I was, how, how I lied and cheated and stole and, and, and drank and, 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 and everything. You can imagine that. But let me tell you something. God loved me enough to put me in a position to have another choice because people prayed for me. My mother prayed for me. My grandmother prayed for me. Put me in a place that somebody prayed for me. And, and whenever I was sitting there that day, we'd been to church from September the 18th to October the 12th. We started the church. September the 18th to October the 12th. I was sitting halfway back in the pew in, in the congregation and the Lord started speaking to me. said, if you don't come and give your life to me today, I'm going to take your mama tomorrow. She was scheduled for carotid artery surgery at Blunt Memorial the next day. And she had a massive stroke after the surgery. Paralyzed her on this side, her leg, her arm. Paralyzed her speech, she couldn't talk. All she knew was mumble. I was under the conviction so much that Judy was sitting beside me beads of sweat size of BB was popping out of my forehead and running down my face like this and I was trembling like this here. I was starting to tremble like this and I noticed Judy started scooting away from me. <laughs> I'm serious. She is a little Baptist girl. thought she got saved at nine years old. It was five years later she realized she had never asked Jesus in her heart. Somebody else prayed the prayer and told her she was saved. At nine years old, had a group of them at the altar, prayed a prayer of, of you know, a sinner's prayer of them, said, now you are saved. And she never participated in it at all, but she had it in her head because somebody told her she was saved. She was saved. Took her five years. We got a video of the, of the, of the seven-year tribulation and they were putting Christians in prison trying to get them to, to, to convert to, uh, to deny Christ and a, a Christian was witness this guy on the borderline and, and the guy on the borderline was listening to this Christian and said, you have to ask Jesus in your heart. You have to repent and ask Jesus in your heart. If you don't do that, you're not saved. She realized she had no participation in her salvation that she thought that she had, which was a false relationship with Christ. She's always a good woman. She never drank. She never did drugs. But she got hooked up with a low-down scum. <laughs> Now I'm going to tell you what he did do. No matter how busted and disgusted I was, whenever that service finished that day, and I jumped up, and I don't know where she was at, and I don't even know what the preacher was preaching, I jumped up and I ran to the altar, and I cried, I mourned, and I, I, I slobbered and everything else for about 30 minutes. <coughs> You know why? Because my Lord came down there right where I was. And, and, and that, that, that nail that drove through His hand and drove the blood out of His hand, He took that cross and turned it into a pencil. And He took and wrote my name in the palm of His hand. I'm not telling you, He didn't write it on this past. He wrote it in the palm of His hand by His blood, by the nail. He's no respecter of person, church. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Glory. hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let me tell you, this is a, this is a, this is the exact picture of where we're sitting in the, sitting in history compared to where they're sitting. We're sitting. We see what happened to them. We got to have the foresight to see what's going to happen to America and the and the fallen church. No wonder the Bible says, "Come out of her, my people." I listened to a man yesterday say that whenever he got out of college, got out of uh, seminary and everything, he took this little church in South Carolina and he's going to preach next week. 65 years old. Just retired from a church up the street here. I tell you what, we had church over there in the park lot in front of the BP yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> he's a Pentecostal man. Hallelujah. He said he got this church. He said he went. He started out. He was just ministering. He said all of a sudden he got this church. He'd been pastor for two years. And he said all of a sudden the ministry song, the song minister of the church, his wife ran off with somebody. One of the other men in the church and the deacons and everything, they've been in that church all their life. One of the other people in churches, wife decided she didn't like her husband. He, he drank and everything. Didn't go to church with her, so she got a divorce from him. Next thing he knew, he went into, he was talking about us sitting around over there talking. I, I started to tell him that, you know, he was talking about sitting around a pot belly stove 40 years ago. He was a, and, and all of them know our gospel and stuff. I, I started telling him, I said, Brother, this is not where we're gospeling. This is where the fire of God's working. <laughs> There's fire here. It's in, not in a pot belly stove. It's in the Holy Spirit. Yes. Amen. He, he figured that out after a while, didn't he? He couldn't get going. He said, I got to go. I'm going to be late. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. But he said, he went in there and he said, he said them guys were sitting there so told him, said they knew he was a young preacher and he'd just been there two years and they said, have you got a wedding to do this Saturday? He said, no, I ain't got no wedding to do this Saturday. He said, there's going to be a wedding this Saturday. They said, there's going to be a wedding this Saturday. He couldn't convince them. He didn't have no weddings. He said, well, go down the block here and look down the road there and you'll see the big wedding this Saturday. Just curiosity, he went down there and sure enough, they was having a wedding. The woman and the man. Well, he, he called his overseer and said, what am I going to do? He should step down. He should step down. Well, he, got, he, he came over and knocked on the door the next day that, that song leader knocked on his door and said, talked to him and said, well, I talked to an overseer and he said, you probably need to step down uh, from being a song leader, but he'd been in the church for 40 years and this pastor had only been there two years. The guy was real nice, real good guy, him and the guy still good friends and everything. But here, he, the guy agreed. Well, he went home. The woman he married didn't agree. Didn't agree. Said it, he didn't have the power to tell him that he needs to sit down. And said he needs to be a vote man. Needs to be a vote man. You can guess what they voted. <coughs> they voted to keep him. Right in the place he was. Voted to keep him right in the place he was. Sometimes it happens. Sometimes it works that way. But you see, we've called the God without repentance. That guy's still the Solomon pastor over there, minister over there. Still preaching the gospel, still singing for the Lord. But let me tell you something. What he experienced is, is nothing compared to what the church has experienced. 
homosexuals and lesbians are ruling the roost now. They're in the, they're in the Catholic Church, they're in the Methodist Church, they're running, they're, they're standing in the pulpit preaching. And let me tell you something. God says it's an abomination to them. God says it's an abomination. I just can't see a free pass. I can't. I just can't. I can't grasp God giving the church a free pass to escape what's coming on the world. What I'm trying to tell you, what Jeremiah was trying to tell them, get their house in order. Amen. Get your house in order. Yes. You can't you can't change things that are happening in this world. You can't change things that are happening between you and your friends. The only one you can change anything about is you. The only thing you can change is your relationships. Your do's and don'ts. I'm going to go back and read verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, What iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they are gone far from me and have walked after vanity? and are become vain. Neither said they, Where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, that led us through the wilderness, through, the, through a land of deserts? It's going to be a desert, desolate place. America is one day soon. and of pits through a land of drought and of the shadow of death through a land that, that no man passed through and where no man dwelt. And I brought you into a plentiful country to eat of the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof but when ye entered, ye defiled my land, and made my heritage an abomination. The priest said not, Where is the Lord? And they that handled the law knew me not. That's what's happening in America. That's what's happening in America from shore to shore. The pastors also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal, and walked after things that do not profit. Wherefore, I will yet plead with you, say, saith the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. For pass over the isles of Chisholm and see and send unto Kurdish and consider diligently and see if there be such a thing. Hath a nation changed their gods which are yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. We look for love in all wrong places. We look for love, but we fail to look to the lover of our soul. One 
today we're going to take off this birthday suit. It's going to go back to the dust where it came from. It ain't going to matter how many people you love or how many people love you because they can't do nothing for you no more. But God's telling us that He's our Creator. Yes. He's the lover of our soul. Yes. He's the Redeemer of our eternal life. He's the provider that John 14 said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am you might be also. Praise God. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Woo, glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Turn to uh, chapter 6. Jeremiah chapter 6. It's about under siege. <clears throat> That's what they're talking about. That's what's going on. That's what's going on in... Uh, uh, Virginia this weekend, what was going on in Chicago a week ago, what's going on in Carson, Carson, uh, Colorado now as we speak. What's going on in America? It's what's going on in America. It's what's going on in America. The America's fixing to start shaking. There's going to be a shaking going on. Amen. Chapter 6 is about under siege. I want to read the start at verse 7. As a fountain casteth her, her waters, so she casteth out her wickedness. Violence and spoil is heard in her. Before me continually is grief and wounds. We be thou instructed, O Jerusalem, lest my soul depart from thee, lest I make thee desolate, a land not inhabited. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall thoroughly glean the remnant of Israel as a vine. Turn back thy hand as a great gatherer into the basket. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ears is uncumbered, uncircumcised. Their, their ears are un ears is uncircumcised and they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. They have no delight in it. They have no delight in it. Verse 11. Therefore I am full of the fury of the Lord. I am weary with holding it. I, I will pour it out uh, uh, on the children abroad and uh, on the assembly of young men together. For even the husband with the wife shall be taken. The age with him that is full of days and their houses shall be turned unto others with their fields and wives together. For I will stretch out my hand upon the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord. Now isn't that what we've heard? That China has been promised out of America when it's overthrown and besieged the women in the land. What's the 
the Word of God say right there to you? Come on, church. Right. Verse 13. For from the least of them even unto the greatest of them, everyone is even to uh, covetousness, and from the prophet even to the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. The they have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly saying peace, peace when there is no peace. There's going to be there's going to be a person step out on the earth and he's going to bring a diplomatic peace. Revelation 6 Chapter 2 talks about that white horse rider that's going to be riding across the earth with a with a uh, a bow without any arrows for it, and that represents a diplomatic peace without firing a shot. But he's going to be the Antichrist. Peace, peace, but there is no peace. Where they were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore, they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the way and see and ask for the old path. Bring that old time gospel back alive. I'll tell you about a time around here. A time when God saved another man, Ronnie Reagan. Jerry Lee. I'll tell you about a time that it wasn't the preacher preaching and, and the fire of God moving. Uh, it was moving from the pulpit through the, through the pews. Do you realize that whoever's up here preaching, Steve and I were talking about yesterday, whoever's up here preaching has to get ex excited 10 or 20 10, 20, 25 times more excited than the whole congregation does to get anybody to even move or say amen or anything. I'll tell you about a time 35, 40 years ago when the preacher was preaching and the, pro and the congregation was jumping out the windows, running around the church, singing praises to God, celebrating God, saving their soul because they were so thankful that God came down
They were praying people. You didn't, whenever you said, let's have a prayer meeting on Tuesday or Saturday morning, the whole place was filled up with people praying. Just like in wartime, in these Jews, the whole place was filled up praying. Because they had something to pray about. They had trouble and tribulation coming on. That brought you close to God. But then it's your job to, to continue in the faith. Yes. Not only when perilous times come. Hallelujah. Yes. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Where is the good way? Let me start back at verse 16. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, uh, said we,
tell you about a good time. It's the high that I got whenever I got up and that altar known that this blood cleansed me. I felt like I was blind as a feather. You have never experienced the load of sin coming off of you? I tell you, it's here right now. It's brief. And it's for you. And it'll never let you down. He loves your soul. <laughs> he loves you completely. He loves you without boundary. He wants to increase you. You know, Paul had to be stoned to death to be taken up to the third heaven and he got a glimpse and he said, I hasn't seen, your hasn't heard, neither has entered into the mind of a man what great things God has in store for those who believe in Him. How can you believe if you don't hear? How can you believe if you don't read? How can you hear? How can you believe? How can you have faith, undying faith, if you don't know Him? Just know about Him. There's an invitation right here. Let's all stand. If you fell up with me last week, she said, I preached there 15 minutes. And I wasn't counting the time, but she was. I thought, I, I felt the Lord move. So, but she said, when we got down to the lake where my daughter was, she said, I was trying to get him set up. I was doing it. <laughs> she gets to see the mild manner. She turns into superwoman, though, when she's up. We love her anyway. I love her too. I love her with all my heart. She's the apple. Well, God's that mild, but she's right in her clothes. Amen. I know. I know. If I thought I ain't bless you, book. Oh. <laughs> no, she wouldn't book me. She said, oh. Oh. Can I even call her again? No. <laughs> no. Praise the Lord. There's the invitation to know this God that we're talking about. You know, when, when all these things start coming down, And all the things that are fixed to be let loose on America, you won't have to fear. You won't have to wonder what to do. You won't have to do none of that stuff. You can, you can have knowledge right now of the refuge that is in Christ Jesus. You can have it. You can have all you want of it. You can have all you want of it. All you got to do is say, Lord, I come as I am. I asked you to help me to be the person you wanted me to be a long time ago. I asked you to use me. Use me, Lord, as I increase in you and grow in the grace of God through Jesus Christ that, that we'll be sanctified and know you in the power of your resurrection. It won't matter what, what whether you're a woman or a man or anything else. God doesn't look on the on the uh, on the male or female. All born again people are massive in the sight of God. How much power does the blood of Jesus have? The blood of Jesus has enough power to cover all of our sins. And when God looks at the blood, He sees the power of redemption. He sees the power of resurrection. He sees the power of life and the light of God shining through the glory of His creation, which is in Christ Jesus. And if you're not in Christ Jesus, You're not in Christ Jesus. Why would you not want to be in Christ Jesus? Oh, I, I, I don't think.
think I can do it. I can't do it. I know you can't do it. He knows you can't do it either. Why do you think he writes it in such a manner to show us that nobody can do it except him? The only way we're going to make it at all is get down and humble ourselves before our Almighty God. It's up to you. It's up to you. Would you come? Would you come with every head bowed, nobody looking around? Every head bowed, nobody looking around. Now I know that the word's been been preached here, but I know the Holy Spirit's been moving too. The Holy Spirit's moving in this house and He's moving in your heart. You're here today. You've heard the, the, the free pardon of sin message that grace is given through the blood of Jesus Christ and it's your gift. Would you receive it today? Would you say, Lord, I want, I want to be cleansed. I want to be forgiven. If you do that, just slip your hand up. I'm not going to call you out or make you embarrassed. He sees that hand. He sees that hand. He sees that hand. That hand. That hand. That hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven people raise their hand. Let's pray for one another, okay? Father, you see the hands that went up. Lord, we need more of You and less of us. Help us to humble ourselves and come to You risen, Lord and Savior. Help each person that raised their hand, Lord, to, before the, the sun goes down this afternoon, Lord, I pray You'd help them to get one-on-one -on -one with You. Confess their sins to you, Lord, not to a man that would deceive them or, or sell them out or do something to, to, to disgrace them or something. Because, Lord, there's things that only, only the individual and you need to know about. You already know. Yet you love them. Love each one of us. Lord, help us not to be like my wife and think that we're saved because some man said that they prayed a sinner's prayer, but help us to help us to come to a place to believe that you are God and there is no other. We see your hand moving across the world and we see your word being fulfilled to the, to the letter, Lord. And if that's not enough evidence for us, Lord, I pray that whatever it takes for every person here there might have been somebody that didn't raise their hand that needs to know you that way too. Lord, I pray for that individual too. Lord, help us all to get real with you just like you're real with us. You're not going to be crucified again. You're not going to be crucified again. Help us to get right with you before it's everlasting too late. We'll give you all the glory and honor for it because we ask in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Love somebody today. Shake their hands. Let them know you appreciate them coming to church today. Amen. Thank you.
here. Yeah, how you doing? Hey, Clint. Oh. <coughs> hmm? I'm trying, you got, you got a, uh, something to clean? Now it worked. No, it did work. I know you like There is Well, there's a blue spot on this thing. 